Good evening. Um, welcome. Um, before we get to the main event tonight, I just want to do a very quick uh, inside house. Um, everybody knows that this morning we finished the NAP visit. So I want to thank all the chairs and the team who worked so hard. Uh, there's nothing to celebrate yet. So I just want to thank everybody who worked so hard. And, uh, and, I, and, and, and so let, let, let's move to much more eventful and interesting talks. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Monica Ponce de Leon. Um, I, I was thinking very hard how to introduce um, somebody like Monica who who has been a friend for so long, somebody who I respect and admire uh, deeply. So I, 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 was try, I was reading a lot of interviews that she done over the years, and one of the many interesting things about, uh, about Monica is she, of course, is an architect, but also she's a dean. Um, she's a, a, a repeater of Fender as a dean. I mean, like, uh, she, she did an extraordinary job at Talman, uh, College of Architecture in Michigan, and then she felt that it was not, she was not done, and she decided to be now dean at Princeton, the School of Architecture. So that's a remarkable thing for those of us who do this kind of job. I don't know how you can do that, uh, or where you find the energy and the commitment and the passion to do it, but it's remarkable that she does that. But th there are many things which I find super interesting in how she approached all this. It's one of those architects who never make a distinction between academia and practice, research and doing. And this is something that in SIA we treasure a lot and we try to do all the time, but the truth of the matter is there are not that many at the end of the day that can claim that they're doing it. There are many people who are talking about it, but not many people who can claim that they're doing it, and she for sure is one of them. Uh, she was mentioned last night, the complexity of her multi-places offices, which I find fascinating, and I hope that she mentioned something of that. But the other thing is, um, at that time, with, with, her, with her previous office, they were among the few, uh, among the early, early architects, they really start to really tackle the relation between the digital fabrication and material and how that will have an impact in the ways of production and construction, which today we take it for granted, but I remember going early on in the GSD days and the, the seminars and the students they were doing, they were incredibly groundbreaking all the time. So. This is somebody who really worked within what I would call the kitchen, what being an architect is, but at the same time, with the same commitment with the highly speculation and theoretical thinking of what architecture is. The other thing which is the, her work has been interesting with the tolerance of material, and some of them with more success than others. She, they did the first installation here in Sayark with rope that successfully collapsed. Um, um, <laughs> We have Greg Lynn in the audience who also has been part of our team of, of, te of testing the limits of things. So the, the, the gallery has a tradition of that, but Monica was really the first one to do it. So that is an extraordinary accomplishment, I guess. So which means that they're always taking risks. But on top of that, she find time to be curators, uh, to be a curator. She was a curator of the American Pavilion uh, of the last Biennale. And also, she find time to be a civil leader and to really interact and try to improve cities and all that. So uh, uh, to conclude, and, and to, without further ado, I, I, will, I will say that in many ways, she is what every architect should aspire to be. So it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to have her back at Sire after a while that she hasn't been around. So please join me to welcome Monica Ponce de Leon. I'm really excited. Uh, to be here today, Hernan, I can't thank you enough. Sayark is probably one of my favorite places um, to be in because of the energy, because of its history. Um, I taught here a long, long time ago as a visiting, um, as a visiting professor for one semester. And I really had an amazing experience, and it was at a very critical moment in my thinking. And it really, it really helped me um, dive into ideas um, about what architecture is and what architecture should be. I am very committed to um, the notion that what we do as architects is to put alternatives uh, out there in the world for what is possible. I think this is the power of architecture. 
Um, but I also am very committed to the notion that we do it within uh, disciplinary, uh, within the discipline and with disciplinary tools. So I have always been interested in how, you know, how we make things and the history of how things are made. And for a long time, I was known with my partner at the time, Nader Terrani, as the people that did bricks. Um, and we were very much committed and excited about um, the various ways in which we could manipulate brick to do things that it, in a way uh, were surprising and uncommon and not thought through necessarily. But also I, was very I have always been very interested in emerging technologies and the relationship between uh, what we do as architects and tools that become available for us to rethink and to challenge. So in that sense, for me, as Hernan described, that relationship between experimenting and um, putting it out there in the world has been both within academia and through practice. And like many of my um, fellow architects here in the audience that I admire so much, I have never created distinctions between what happens in the studio, what happens in workshops, and then what I try to do out there in the world. Whether it is, you know, very early on by looking at the potential of laser cutting, it seems now so sort of basic and mundane, but rethinking issues that are deep to the discipline like tolerance and thinking about precision and how to, in a way, have a tool that does not want to be precise, pretend to be precise. Or taking a material like stone that is very much about solidity and has such a long history in a stereotomy about really making the shape through solid. And using robotic fabrication as a way of testing its limit and understanding how it can be self-supporting even though it's very, very thin and what kinds of effects then are produced by its thinness. These are issues that, I'm, that I am very much still exploring. Right now I'm doing um, a World War II memorial in Wellington, for the US, in Wellington, New Zealand, and we're using robotic fabrication as a way of testing the shaping of stone, but also its perception from multiple points of view. So for me, speculation really goes across all scales of the discipline, from the very basic of how to construct things and the idea that you can reimagine assembly of components so that you modify the component itself. And in that way, you may not actually need scaffolding. You might actually not need centering for it to be put together but that the detail itself can actually help, to, the detail itself can be a guide for how to arrive at the overall shape. This is something that I tested um, in an academic context, but then we very deftly deployed in um, the quote unquote so-called real world. So the lessons that we learn from our research then can be deftly deployed um, in projects that really have to deal with all of the contingencies of projects that deal with clients and existing spaces and budgets and the limitations of working with a particular set of builders. The, for me, the relationship between part to whole, um, whether it is a tectonic unit to the overall form of a building or a particular space to the building type, is one of the th things that for me has been my obsession. And I think that that's an area, changing those relationships of the part to the whole is one where we can really reimagine buildings, but we can also reimagine space. So when we were approached by BP to build this gas station in Los Angeles, the challenge was how do you reclad the existing gas station so that it acquires a new identity. 
we were asked to do it as a demonstration project with the idea that it would be repeatable, that we could do it elsewhere in other cities. Unfortunately, the project after this one demonstration fell apart. The person that was in charge left BP. But the concept was that we will design one element that then could be modified, ad adjusted, um, and then again could be deployed in different cities with different size gas, gas stations, with different uh, imperatives. So what we did is we designed basically a mushroom column. And this mushroom column um, is made of different pieces that then can be expanded, distorted, pushed against, pushed through, um, deflected, inflated. And even the possibility that the column itself might be bloated and in its bloating, it may actually then be occupiable within itself. Now, of course, um, these seem like very simple techniques today, but at the time for us, that relationship between panelization and the overall geometry were things that we were pursuing almost as if they were new through new tools after having experimented with them in very low-tech ways. Now, one of the things that I also think is important to the discipline as you find your voice is to be extremely self-critical. So when we were asked by this client to do um, a dining services, um, basically like a cafeteria for 2,000 people in the middle of a skyscraper in New York, our partner for that project was Gensler. So my thought was, this is an amazing opportunity to move away from the notion of the panel and the many pieces making the whole. So instead, I really wanted to pursue uh, the idea of the smooth and to attempt to actually suppress the components that make up architecture. But of course, the challenge is that you still have to contend with all of the things that, as architects, we tend to dislike like um, HVAC supply and returns, like uh, sprinkler heads. I mean, I think the ceiling is fantastic. Usually when I talk about the project, I try to point at these things in the ceilings and the ceiling beat me to it. Um, but how do we deal with all of these extraneous things that tend to be in contrast and in tension with the architecture and actually think of it as part of the language of uh, it's this space. So what we did was very simple. We did a crack, a crack that was three and a half inches, and then everything fit within that gap. And then what, what seems to be whimsical, which is the actual shape of the space and the shape of the lines, is actually the, re the result of allowing the different consultants to place things where they fit best, and our job was simply to go ahead and connect the lines, I mean, connect the dots. So of course, what seems to be smooth is not at all. Even that which seems seamless is, of course, made out of many pieces. Um, and when we finished the space, we went ahead and we gave a hint of that panelization that is hidden behind the plaster by simply altering the texture of the material just ever so slightly. So I recently have had the opportunity to speculate about one of the oldest American problems, a problem that seems to be outmoded, but at the same time seems to never go away, which is the single family home in America. And I have, this is the first time I show the project, and in working on the presentation, I really 
I, I really wanted to bring about sort of a prototypical image of a single American home. And I apologize, I just could not bring myself to put it on the screen. I looked at many ugly ones that seem generic enough, and it's just not in my nature. So instead, um, I decided to put one of my favorite houses, which is Elliot Noyes' house for himself, um, because I'm actually very interested in this problem. Elliot Noyes is an architect doing a house for himself. I'm moving too much, am I, am I not? I'm so sorry. He warned me not to move, but I can't help it. Um, and this is actually a house that, unfortunately, I'm doing for me and my family. Um, so I have felt a certain kind of kingship with Elliot Noy. So I ended up deciding for the purpose of today to bring the image um, of the house that he did for himself in New Canaan, which is, of course, not at all a prototypical single family home. And perhaps there is no such a thing as a prototypical single family home. So, as I was saying before, we love to hate single family homes. We love to say that they are a thing of the past. We love to criticize their environmental footprint. But they continue to be the way that we measure economy in America. Housing starts is how we measure how well the American economy is doing. And it continues to be what we call the American uh, dream. So in in pursuing this as a topic, one of the things that my husband and I decided was that we should really think of it not just in terms of a house for ourselves, which is quite indulgent, but to think of it actually as a prototype of what the single family home could and should uh, be. So we've been, I have been really um, struggling with how to think through um, the different issues and the different models, and what, what might be relevant and what might not be so relevant. And of course, one has tendencies, and one tends to like certain veins in history. It's impossible as an architect to think of the single family home and not think of a very rich legacy um, of the glass house, whether it's Farnsworth house or the one that I like better, which is Philip Johnson's glass house. And the idea that actually space is really completely defined by placing an object and a couple of lines in space. Or at the other end of the spectrum, something like a Palladian Villa, which really fills the box of the volume of the architecture with very perfect geometric figures that define the daily life uh, of the household. Of course, neither one can work as a model. Uh, today, we can pretend that either one could, but neither one actually would suffice. So I started thinking about um, a less prototypical project, the Schroeder House. We're all familiar with the uh, project, but it's had no imitators, uh, perhaps because it's such a fantasy. The idea that you will be transforming space every day, that you go from a completely open space to one that is completely sub subdivided. And perhaps because it's too dependent on tracks and movable parts for it to be quote unquote uh, practical. But I have been thinking of this notion of the change through time how a family changes and evolves through time, how we change and evolve through time, and the fixity of architecture. So what if we reimagine the house as a container that actually anticipates multiple futures? Not a container that responds to today, but a container that actually may anticipate multiple futures. So the house is designed really as a as a plinth that contains a series of objects. And these objects, of course, just like Philip Johnson's house, contain bathrooms, closets, you know, the things that you don't actually want to expose in any way, shape, or form. But what if these containers within them, from the outset, had the capacity to change and move and actually in, um, 
create a different way of thinking of rooms. So we designed the containers so that the walls actually flip out. It's very simple, door hinges. The doors and the walls are one and the same. Basically, we're doing oversized doors. They're six feet wide. Um, and walls that are not fixed, but it actually swing like a door. And this kind of movement then can accommodate the everyday um, and fluidly move between a free plan and one that might be more cellular. So in a way, leaving Poche in favor of the free plan and vice versa. So we opted for a one-story floor plan with the idea that we can actually age in place. Um, in Michigan, we lived in a two-story house, and um, we know the limitations that it, this is going to bring about as we grow older. So that horizontality of the ground um, is really reflected for us in the horizontality of the roof. So the roof is pretty conventional. This owes quite a bit to mid-century homes, the idea of this flat roof, which everybody says leaks, but doesn't have to. Um, we think of the roof as something that is accessible. We think of the roof as something that really elevates the ground. So this house for us is more like a podium that elevates the ground and gives you another ground. But actually, the volumes that make up the floor plan are not neutral. They're actually not flat roofed. These volumes actually pierce through and seek their own light through the datum of uh, the ceiling and actually become volumes that are figural and that are three-dimensional and that give character to those spaces that are entrapped within the architecture. This, of course, in turn has the effect of creating an artificial landscape. And it's artificial in two ways. One, because it's a green roof. Um, but two, because the mounds are geometric. And it really push, puts forth the notion that the roof is really an artificial plane from which you can experience, have a new experience of the ground. So we. We have designed the house so that the house will never need to be remodeled. So we thought of every closet, not as a closet, but as a future kitchenette. We thought of every wall, not as a wall, but as a wall that could actually uh, offer more possibilities for use. And I think we got them really quite carried away. Um, so we know that we're going to be using this as an office and as a guest room. We plan to rent this, um, we plan to uh, install kitchenettes um, into the walk-in closets of the children's rooms in the future and rent them. Um, potentially, we can also rent this one. But we're also thinking that in the future, we might actually rent the whole, move out and rent the whole thing. Um, but the intent at the end of the day, and I know we got carried away, my daughter is really terrified that we're going to rent her room. She says she's going to pay rent herself. <laughs> but at the end, the intent is to think of an architecture that does not need to be remodeled, to think of an architecture that embedded within it anticipates the possibility of a multiple life, a different life, a different future. So, because my projects have tended to be, um, because all my projects are in the United States, I tend to think of the, um, the problem of, I, th I tend to think of problems that are uniquely American. Um, and it's not by chance that I tend to speculate about suburban conditions. This is a site in Florida. This is what downtown, downtown Pompano Beach looks like in Florida. If I tell you this is a downtown, you will not believe me. But hidden within this picture is actually a different picture. The site I just showed you is right here. And it's at the intersection of three dif distinct neighborhoods that make, make up Pompano Beach. 
One neighborhood is predominantly white. One neighborhood is predomin predom predominantly African American. Um, and another neighborhood is a little bit more mixed between Hispanics and African Americans. But Pompano is really, really poor. Um, so the existing project is here in the middle of the white neighborhood. We were asked to do a combined library and cultural center. And the idea was to close down this library, move it to the downtown, and combine it um, with another program. What brought these two, program to get, two programs together is actually a grant, a grant to bring technology um, to Pompano, and a grant that would allow the library component to be somehow technologically advanced, and a, and a grant that would allow this cultural center to actually be an educational center for the community. The challenge, however, is that there were two clients, and two clients with very different ideas as to um, what, how the building should function. The cultural center wanted the door where it should be, in the front, and then the library wanted the door in the back. Um, now, this might seem like a crazy idea, who wants a door in the back, um, but actually, when you think about a certain segment of library users, they are older, they don't walk, they don't use public transportation, they're never gonna use this bus stop, they're actually always gonna park here, and they tend to be the louder ones, the ones that are gonna email the people that are making the decisions and complain, um, then you understand why the library would want to put the door in what seemed to be a back. Mm. So we reconceived the building not as having a front, but actually as having two sides, two fronts in a way. Um, but two fronts that are then connected by a new space, a breezeway, and a breezeway that becomes a courtyard open to the sky. This allowed us to completely reconsider the, the given typology. In Florida, libraries are very flat, cultural centers are very flat. So what we did instead is that we intertwined the two programs. So the cultural center climbs on top of the library, and in turn, the library climbs on top of the cultural center. So the two fronts are given equal value but again, they're both connected through the breezeway. This project is just finished construction. I don't have great pictures. So I apologize because I'm gonna show both photos and renderings um, until we get a good set of pictures. And some of the photos are from my iPhone. Um, so what was interesting for us as architects was to begin to delineate um, what these breezeways could be. The ceilings are not incredibly high. This is, a, this is a very low budget project. So how could we use the shaping of the columns, which are then constructed with a very cheap material, just the stucco, um, how could we use the, sh the shaping of the columns as a way of giving continuity, identity, and a certain effect to the spaces that is outside of the norm for a project of this kind in Florida. One of the things that was important was for the reading room to be separated from the children's uh, library. Children's are noisy. Retirees want it quiet in the reading room. So that turning off the project, um, which is then gauged by the staircase allowed us to create that separation while still maintaining connectivity. For the reading room, we decided to break the typical relationship between reading and stacks. Libraries are losing their stacks rapidly um, because they don't, the, what they need is the space for people to come together. They don't need the space for storing of books. So that actually allowed us to think of, that, of, of the stacks as almost low walls that begin to define uh, sitting areas, as opposed to that marked dis distinction between stacks and reading room. So while the library cli climbs, 
uh, over the cultural center. The uh, cultural center in the upper level is defined by the presence of a very large black box, a black box that is used predominantly at night and is used not just for uh, experimental theater performances, but also for weddings, for also for uh, um, events, is rented by the city, is actually one of the main sources of income. And we very purposefully um, decided to have a window, which I know is counterintuitive to a black box, as a way of having the project announce itself um, to the community at large. So one of the things that was important for us about the project is the idea that the building would have the capacity to change over the course of time. That depending on whether it was a sunny day, a cloudy day, early in the morning, rainy, after, um, after the rain, dusk, dawn, that in fact the figure of the building was one that was not static but actually a figure that will take advantage of the kind of dramatic changes of light and dramatic changes of climate that are possible uh, in Florida. It was also important for us, the idea that the building is open until very late every day and that there is always activities happening um, and that the way that the building will glow would really create a distinction between its character um, early in the morning, let's say, and really, really, really late at night. So as I said, the project, oopsie, the project just opened a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the volume of the building as it acquires the image of the sky transforms as the time of day evolves. and and in a, in a way it absorbs its uh, context. I was very interested in this potential of buildings. If you think, for example, of um, the John Hancock Tower in Boston, where the top of the tower disappears into its environment, I wanted to see if we could do it actually in contrast to other materials that produce other kinds of figures as opposed to the building as a whole. So this is an image by Alexander Cordas. It's a, st it's a film still from his 1936 film, The Shape of Things to Come. Um, and what I find fascinating about it is that it already within it contains many of the elements that we as architects seem to be obsessed with when dealing with large scale um, spaces like atriums. The space already shows elevators, um, you know, that command a view of the space, the idea of repetitive balconies, one after the other, as a way of creating sort of the effect of infinity. And then, of course, very important, even though it's a little weak in, this, in his image, the idea of trapping nature, the idea that you can actually, as, an, as a designer contain the whole world within. This, of course, has been mastered beautifully by Porman, and I have always, I have to say since I was very little, I've always been fascinated by Porman's ability to contain the world within, um, and yet project a new way of thinking about the world. This is the Hyatt Regency in Atlanta. And what is fascinating about the higher Regency is that, of course, over time, the ivy began to grow in the balconies. This is when it opened. This was years later. And what is amazing about it is that he thought of the long term, but also he thought of somehow um, nature being captured within this space. The reason I'm showing this is because I was commissioned to do um, a renovation of an atrium in New York City. So I was very interested in this idea of the large space that somehow is used as a way of capturing um, the outside, as a way of recreating an, um, 
recreating something that really was meant to be exterior. So of course, I do not get a nice, beautiful poor man. Instead, this is what I got. So this is drywall. Uh, these are drywall balconies. 1986 building. I have to say that Mira, who is here in the audience, was my partner in crime in the project. So when I say we, I'm talking about Mira and me. It was um, really, um, for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, for me, it's interesting to think of the problem of how to measure the scale of space um, against the idea of a semi-public nature. Now, while the existing space was not great, the location, I think, is uh, quite interesting. The building in question is this one. It was an old embassy suite, and is now a Conrad Hilton. What is fascinating about it is that it actually faces the water. It's in front of a ferry station, but also in front of a public space. It's the monument to Irish a potato famine. And it serves actually to connect to a network of public spaces in the area. Behind us is a fantastic cover plaza by uh, Scott Cohen. So this is a part of a larger idea of lower Manhattan. One of the challenges, however, is that the existing space is raised 24 feet from the ground um, because one of the uh, code one of the zoning ordinances in Lower Manhattan uh, calls for higher grounds for public spaces as a way of dealing with flooding. So this was the existing condition, a wall to the ground and just a very tenuous escalator connection and a very narrow atrium that was uh, 15 stories high. Another challenge for the existing space is the way that um, the building was not just a hotel, but actually a hotel that was merged with a multiplex. So the atrium itself really is pressed against um, the multiplex, and the multiplex has a, quite, a, uh, quite a presence on the atrium. So, the impetus of zoning in Lower Manhattan is to ensure that all of these public, semi-public spaces actually remain public. And zoning calls for a right of way of four feet, I know it sounds awful, um, to cut through the space and connect back down to the ground. So this is the condition in which we found ourselves, how to transform this into something else. The other thing that I want to point out is the way that the um, multiplex was dealt with was by actually doing a soloed drawing on the walls, on the blank walls of the multiplex. And the poor, the poor soloed sits like a box um, on a blank wall that then is masqueraded with this bamboo uh, planter. It's, it's quite strange. So our first move is pretty straightforward. We placed really grand stairs at both ends of the lobby, and we expanded public space underneath the volume of the multiplex as a way of really making a public scale as opposed to a narrow corridor. Um, we always refer to the stairs jokingly as Piazza de España. It's not Piazza de España. You cannot sit on them. The way that you would in Piazza de España will be a little weird. But the intent was to really connect the ground up to um, that new public level. So we went from this as an existing condition to this. Now, 
The biggest challenge in the project, what I call the elephant in the room, was how to deal with the presence of the sol duet in the atrium. When you think of atriums, they're airy, they're large, they're big space. They don't have an object encrusted within its volume. But in our case, of course, um, the soluid was everything. The soluid really took over the space. But it took over the space in an uncomfortable way, in a way that really did not fit. I have to say that during the interview for the project, I proposed to paint it over, <laughs> to which the client said, no, we're not gonna do that. You're really gonna have to figure out what to do with it. Um, I am surprised that I was hired because I said this in a very serious way. I thought we should just paint it over. I felt that the soluid really was being done a disservice by the way that it was crammed into the space. So our first move was to really objectify it, to get rid of that aquar base that it was given, let it float, um, and to then really build very strong pylons underneath it that could visually hold the weight of its mass. We also went ahead and manipulated the um, elevators, adding perforated metal so that there was no stripes as an image next to the drawing itself. So the project really became how to frame um, the views of the soluet and how to use that as a catalyst for dealing with the emptiness and vacuity of the, the space. The space is just too large, too narrow, but also um, not intentional enough. So we started thinking of the frame not as a two-dimensional frame, um, but as a three-dimensional frame, something that could be perceived in multiple ways. We also thought of it as layers, so that you would veil and unveil, frame from different points of view, but also expose and layer. And most importantly, I really was intrigued by the notion of how to somehow capture nature without literally capturing nature. And the idea that you can actually create a certain atmospheric effect through materiality as opposed to through dematerialization. So our strategy was to introduce a series, what I call veils, um, suspended from a new frame. And for these veils then do the job of filling the space while still allowing you to experience its <coughs> monumentality, mediating the soluid while still allowing you to experience it. So in a way, I got to paint the soluid after all. So the geometry of the veils um, comes from two things. One is the pressure of the movie theaters into the space, but also the fact that there was already a structure holding the skin, uh, a triangular structure already holding the skin that in a way became the generator of the geometry. The veils are not only extruded, but they're also shaped um, as a way of giving, as a way of, in a way, pulling away so that you can then understand um, different contingencies. So from different points of view, the veils give way, block, filter, frame. The bottom of the veil, which we, we dubbed the lower ring, um, were not simply plain, planar cuts. They were shaped 
on the one hand to give, to, in a, on the one hand to make reference and allusion to the soloed drawing, but also as a way of creating different implications for space. We were very interested in producing um, almost like a virtual ceiling that broke the scale down of the atrium. We also modified all the balconies. They, they, are, uh, they were shaped in Korean. And the shaping um, allowed us to transform the space from bottom to top with the alibi of acoustics as a way of producing variation between the bottom shape and the top shape. You need it more at the bottom and less at the top. But also as a way of creating different frames in different levels and experiencing the um, atrium through that long framing device. So then the notion of the veil became almost like a, for us a, a point of reference for the rest of the project. And when we started doing the, um, when we started doing the conference center, the main stagger then um, became another element in the composition. It's a suspended stair, no longer um, fiber cables, but instead uh, cables clad in wood. The geometry of the stair, like the rest of the lobby, really comes from the geometry of the site and understanding the potential for the discrepancy between the two streets as a way of generating um, unique a unique language. So while the stair reads are suspended in the bottom, on the top it becomes an object, um, and one that really helps organize space. So in the previous image, I showed that top frame as a flat frame, and that's how we started the project. Um, we were really worried about budget, and how this was sort of a crazy idea. It was a crazy idea that we showed as a concept during the competition stage. I never thought this was gonna be built. When the client fell in love with it, I thought this is never gonna happen. So we were trying to be very mindful. And the client really hated that top. Um, and then we realized that we actually needed to distort that upper frame as a way of fitting the cleaning basket to clean the skylights in the space. So the upper frame is really the result of understanding the relationship between the top of the soluet and the space for the cleaning basket. my B movie. This space is very difficult to photograph um, and it's even more difficult to video. Um, so this is my attempt at producing a video for it.
Thank you so much. I'll be happy to take questions.